Cool. Hello, welcome back. Uh, we're back. I'm Callum. This is Catherine and Caitlin for our last episode of Looking at Women. Thank you very much for this very interesting and engaging series. Um, but before we're done, we're talking about Jean D'Almon. Uh, so, as usual, if you'd like to just maybe give us a bit of context about the film and what Chantal Ackerman's doing here. Totally. So, Chantal Ackerman made Jean Dillman in 1975. Um, following filmmakers such as Agnes Varda or Vera Chitlova, um, women have really started to gain prominence in the world of cinema, albeit a small slip, and it is still a small slip when you get to um, the kind of big wage earners in cinema, but there was definitely a space for a feminine language on screen. And um, when John Dillman was released in 1975, it had huge critical acclaim. Um, Ackerman was only 25, and it was a kind of magnus opus that she'd produced. Indeed, the newspaper Le Monde stated that Jean Dillman was the first masterpiece in the feminine in the history of cinema. Um, and I think that says it all, really. I praise. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> and so this is, I, I genuinely a question, this is, this was after Cleo, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So is Ackerman building on ideas that we discussed in Cleo, or is she kind of taking it in her own direction here? So the commercial release was 10 years after Cleo from five to seven. Um, yeah, she's kind of building on ideas in the sense that um, we've got a feminine language on screen, but it's a very different feminine language. And Ackerman was very clear to um, state that there should be as many different ways as there are women making films. And so even though she was showing the life of a mother, the domestic space, the people who are usually cut off of the screen, the kind of um, what... Um, Yvonne Margiela's calls the images between images. Um, she was doing it in her own way. You know, for Vardra it was quite, um, I think it was a bit more of a bold, um, stylized film. I don't know if that makes sense, but you know it's kind of fun, there's quite a lot of pop culture in it, mm. there are a lot of political events that stream into the film. Um, for Ackerman, it was like, elegant, you know, it was... Um, not to say the Vardas wasn't, but there was this real confidence in it that when even the smallest whisper and the smallest voice deserved the biggest space and the longest amount of time on screen. I think that's a very good way to put it because it is a you do it does strike you as a story. It's just a story of a woman in their home and the fact that it is so long and she really I mean it's to the film's power that she dwells and takes her time. And so I suppose just getting into some of the <clears throat> what you said in your article i mean what is what's ackerman's idea here what what's she playing around with in terms of um women in domestic space so um as we were talking about earlier the title um jean dillman 23 qui de commerce you know brussels um immediately links jean with her domestic space and jean's um psychological sphere with that of the home and um, in the film, the home is set up as a place of labour, of paid labour and unpaid labour. Um, right at the beginning, we see the camera um, seemingly too low, which, as we know now, is Ackerman's height. So actually a different sort of feminine gaze because she's a smaller sort of woman. Um, showing the hand of Jean sticking out to a man who's just slept with her, giving her money. We realise that this is about transaction and her home space is linked to um, the body labour that she produces as a prostitute. However, as we get to see throughout the rest of the film, it's also about the unpaid labour, the care that a mother gives to her son and her home. And um, yeah, kind of it's a social role she plays, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what about the space itself? Watching it is very striking, the repetition and the the fact even that the Ackerman uses the same shots in this very claustrophobic and um, prison, to create a kind of prison-like yeah. environment. 
Totally, and there are kind of two things for me that did that. I'm not sure if you felt the same way. Um, one of them was the decor, as you said, so the repeat pattern wallpaper that's reflected in the perfectly polished table so it comes at her from all edges. And then the you know, grid of the tiles in the bathroom, of the tiles in the kitchen, the grid on her apron that she wears when she cooks. Everything is about kind of entrapment, enclosure. Um, you know, it's kind of unbearably close to her. And the second thing that um, creates a sense of entrapment, which does quite the reverse, is that Ackerman never uses a point of view shot or a close up. And so we're always estranged. And we get the sense that um, Jean's feminine condition is one of a woman who's isolated from society because she's chained to her home. Mm-hmm. Something on the point of repetition, which is this came up in one of her interviews, but she was saying part of that is influenced by her Jewish family, a lot to do with like the males repeating certain actions um, and having like a routine throughout the day. And she said part of it comes from repetition being a sort of sense of comfort. You know what you're doing, it fills your time and you can stick to the routine. Um, But you were saying that there's something quite sort of eerie about that and then when she, there's a moment where she I think she like wakes up too early and she's got like an hour and you see her sat there not knowing what to do with herself and um Ackerman talks about that point where you like you're stuck in a routine and then you break that and you don't know what to do with yourself and that must have been the case for a lot of women I feel like she's commenting on that as well that there's that beautiful quote from Ackerman where she says um The housewife occupies time to avoid anguish. To keep moving says not to think about the fundamental thing, which is being. And you get the sense if she thought about what it was to be, if Mm. she stopped filling all of her time, she'd have no reason to be. Mm. Her son's really rather independent on his own. She's got no living relatives Mm. with her. It's fascinating. There is this sort of self-imposed kind of, in a sense, self-imposed. It's almost like what she knows and there's something almost you sense that, like you were saying, with the, when she wakes up and doesn't know what to do, it's that almost that fear of breaking the mould, which is quite the... It's it, There's a sort of parallel with Cleo and the idea of death. It's like she's almost so afraid of the death it's just, and just clings on to what she knows no matter how oppressive it is. This is when the French language is quite exciting because le petit mort is the word for an orgasm in mm-hmm. French, the small death, and that's the point of, you know, the death of Cleo's prior self in um, Cleo from five to seven is the same sort of turning point um, as in Jean Dillman when she has presumably an unwanted orgasm with one of her clients. And how do we know? Like in Dracula, Prince of Darkness, her hair becomes unfurled, a button pops open, you know, she's been <laughs> sexually <laughs> awakened. And prior to this, her son says to her, um, if I was a woman, I wouldn't want to have sex with someone I wasn't completely attracted to. And she just says, you're not a woman. You know, as if it's in a woman's condition to not enjoy sex. Sex is another form of like personal labour that she's got to go through. And so at the point of transition, when she has an orgasm, suddenly everything she knows, all her comfort, all of her routine gets upturned. It's not what she knows, it's frightening. It's potentially also quite relieving because she finally... <laughs> what's the best way to put it she finally kills the guy who's abusing her time and her body <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think Ackerman's feeling in making this film is is it a kind of I get a sense that there's a kind of well understandable anger do you think bubbling or is it is it different to that and how does it compare to how Varda and other because you talked at the start about how you know every I can't remember the quote but the like each feminine voice of cinema should there's like each one to each female filmmaker. So what do you think that Ackerman's feeling is here? Well, I got the impression that for Ackerman, it was I don't think it's anger per se. I think it's more like the Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, and it's a book I always go back to because um, it's about a woman trapped in a space with a repeat pattern wallpaper who kind of goes mad because of her isolation, and it's a theme we've seen throughout pretty much all of the films because the women tend to be isolated and therefore trapped and enclosed in either a physical space, like in Gilda, you know, she's literally the prisoner of Johnny, um, all the way through to um, Judy 
in Vertigo, who is trapped in this man's like bizarre image of who she should be. And in Jean Dillman as well, you get the sense that it's just the grid has literally of her home has literally pushed on her so far that she just has to burst, you know. I'm not sure this is a very good example or not, but sometimes when you buy meats from the deli and they put them in that like string case and you know if you squeeze it too tight the meat just all kind of pops out and loses its <laughs> shape. And I feel like that's what the grid does to her, you know, if it gets too oppressive or something changes in it, like having the orgasm, mm. then it has to erupt. Mm. That's, yeah. And I feel like there is a the isolation and the you know, we talk, we've talked about the domestic space already and how that is the kind of meat mesh or whatever <laughs> in that analogy. Um, not... <laughs> On my grave. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, how also the lack of characters apart mm. from uh, the, the protagonist, Jean, and her son and how... I was struck by, and we talked about this earlier, that the female characters that are present aren't allowed to be present almost. And it's this very strange kind of different... It, it to me, created this kind of universality of the experience where it's, you know, all these women individually experiencing the same kind of oppression but not even able to talk about it with each other. I think that's a really beautiful point and partly the point of um, John Dillman, you know, if one woman's story is told, then other women realise they're not alone in it. And partly being isolated allows John to go to her extreme, which actually allows her to find some sort of agency. I think the, um, you know, the neighbour who knocks on the door, who's played by Chantal Lackman, which I quite like, <laughs> like kind of in-joke, um, has a monologue about buying meat at the market or the meat shop. and she's so kind of overwhelmed and lost and disinterested and she doesn't really know what her purpose is she just buys veal that's really expensive that her kids don't eat and she's worried it doesn't have very many vitamins in anyway um but says she'll probably do the same again because all the other women are doing it and it's exactly that you know we all follow the crowd partly because that's what's expected of us yeah and it, that is related to this idea that um there are definite parallels with Cleo as well but even within this film what we were talking about earlier where she's almost afraid of breaking the mould and Cleo is just living the role she's been taught to perform in a sense yeah and do you think there's something of um, Ackerman about this after not to say it's a kind of direct link but she was only 25 Mm. and you were talking about what do you do after you've made this great piece so young are you also trapped in that role yeah Uh, well yeah like we were saying you've said that um Ackerman actually went on to explore sort of other forms of art and explore her work in that but it must be hard if you you are you've sort of reached you feel like you've reached the pinnacle of what you want to do in your filmmaking and explored those ideas and everybody's sort of praising you for it it must be hard to sort of move past that and develop more work that you feel is still going to comment on the things you want to comment about um, that people aren't going to then respond sort of <laughs> less favourably to <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, I don't know if Ackerman is trapped though um, in that I get the feeling that she's sort of a woman who doesn't feel like she ever wants to be trapped and I think in terms of what Jean Dielman is about um, I think she's writing about what she knows from seeing her, maybe like her mother. I think there's something to do with her having lots of aunts mm-hmm. as well and her seeing um, their lifestyles and that sort of being brought into the film and her commenting, the film is sort of about that and she doesn't want to have that herself. She's breaking away from it. Um, so yeah, I don't think she's trapped. trapped yeah. yeah, I don't know if you think... No. <laughs> no, no, I was just kind of interested that, you know, you the industry creates this sort of arena around you as well. And mm. Ackerman was obviously really keen for this to be a great film. She bought diamonds, was it yeah. shares of diamond stock that she sold at the age of 25 to make a film? She tracked down Delph- um, is it Delphine Serig, who plays Jean, 
who was in last year Marion Bad, um, Le Petit Plaisir de la Bourgeoisie by Bunuel. Mm-hmm. Have I got that name right? Maybe I didn't. Huh. Um, I think it was Bunuel. And, um, you know, so she went for a really fantastic psychological actress and then asked her to play an incredibly mundane role. <laughs> he has great guts and confidence in that. Mm. And, I mean, just thinking about the mundanity of it, those really long shots, you get a great sense of the housewife's labour in doing this. You know, it's you really feel the heavy time of the film. And there often isn't action per se. And that's the whole point, is that you share in this um, sense of unpaid labour, which so many women are taking part mm. in. Mm. With um, the actress as well, I don't know. I don't know her name. Oh, Delphine Sissi. Yeah, she. I think Ackerman wrote it with her in mind. But um, again, sorry, I keep going back to this interview, but it's quite interesting. She was saying she wanted it to be her because she often played a role that wasn't anything like Jean Dielman. I don't know what else she's been in, but Ackerman was saying she wanted people to see that. A woman, no matter what type of woman she was, often has to fulfil these roles and she wanted that to be played out on screen. So whether or not she was like a glamorous Hollywood actress or whatever, she was still a woman and she probably at home still had to do or was doing all of these things and at like some point felt constrained and she had to fulfil some sort of role. There's this nice kind of dialogue between Seyrig and Ackerman as well when they're filming. Um, Seyrig said that Ackerman would sit maybe on the table with a potato or something, you know. And she'd mime the action almost like a mirror um, of what Delphine should do. And then they'd play it through and Ackerman would say, instead of, you know, filming space, we're going to film time. So the camera doesn't move like in La Chambre piece that she did, which was a 360 of a bedroom, which is also exciting because it, again, thinks about that kind of enclosed space. Um, But this time around, she goes, it's a good time. And so all the actions are done by like 25 seconds, two minutes. Um, it doesn't have to be actual per se, but I think the actuality is is that um, John is always wanting to keep busy, you know, and kind of having a slightly OCD, or I think it's quite an OCD, response to your um, living condition does that because it means your hands are always busy. And I was just thinking as well when I was writing, I thought, okay, why is it important today and why should women be watching us today and men? And, who, who's it important for? And I thought, well, why do we want to have control? We want to have control because we don't feel like we can be autonomous if somebody's putting a lot of pressure on us. And it made me think about a lot of young women who have anorexia because that's another form of control. And that is a, a total control of your body and the way you look. Um, sometimes because of social pressures to look a certain way. Sometimes because of pressures to perform something you don't want to do. Um, and it's got that same um, regiment to it. So in that sense, you know, Ackerman touched on a really key mm-hmm. issue for women. Maybe an interesting way to end then is to think about um, how domestic space is used in films today. Because we were talking about Gongal previously in the podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, and that also explores the kind of beige mundane in domestic space. And the colour scheme in Jean Dillman is very um, muted and pallid. And it's not made for excitement, you know. It's um, it's a working space. And, um, you know, she keeps it very clean. She lays a towel on the sheet to have sex. It's so... Um, yeah, it's perfunctory. There's no real enjoyment mm-hmm. there. And um, I think in that sense, you know, in, in kind of women's films, even domestic... Um, not domestic housewives, they're called desperate housewives, as we were talking <laughs> about previously... Um, or in Downton Abbey or in Mad Men, you know, lots of TV shows. Um, we also see this exploration of women who start to kind of buck this trend and who don't want to be trapped in their house anymore. And in Downton Abbey, just because the film's coming out, you know, the character that stands out for me is Lady Sybil, mm-hmm. who goes and buys a pair of trousers, mm-hmm. then marries below her. Um, or Lady Mary, the eldest daughter who can't inherit any of her father's estate unless she marries, you know, her third cousin or something. And so, you know, time and time again, in that different time periods, we see this issue of the home coming up. And I just wonder if it's kind of a rooted issue that women will continue to have to battle, or whether changes like being able to breastfeed your baby at work, or um, being able to have paternity pay will make a difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think, I mean, first of all, do you, both of you, 
feel a that you connect with what Jean is feeling in any sort of way and b if so did watching it have a what kind of feeling did it have um I don't think I actually did really feel in any similar way to how Sean feels in some ways it's I think it's less about being a woman for me and more about it would be the repetition and the mundaneity of every day, but I'm not like a mother, I'm not a housewife. I'm quite like, so in that way, I don't really feel, I don't think I've felt how Jean probably is portrayed to feel in the film. I don't know if you do. I think for me, there was that moment right at the end in particular where and she's having sex, she's not enjoying it, it's quite perfunctory, but then she's having an orgasm, she's enjoying it, and I thought, oh, there are definitely times when I've not been having sex, but been in a situation where I've been doing something that I've begrudgingly done. Mm -hmm. um, particularly, actually, in terms of study, and academic study, like taking further maths, for example, I really mm -hmm. didn't want to study it. Um, but everyone told me it'd be great for me, I should just get it out of the way. And I was getting small pleasures from thinking, oh, they've asked me to be in this like small math class and they think that I'm good enough to do it. They're thinking that I want to kind of equal footing to the guys because it was mostly a male class. Um, but I hated it because there was such a kind of hyper-masculine um, atmosphere in the whole class. And um, at the end of, you know, a very short amount of time studying this because it just drove me to the bitter <laughs> end of annoyance. I did kind of feel the same as Jean when she takes the scissors in at the end, you know, when <laughs> there were all... I know, when there was this attitude... I hope this isn't a confession. <laughs> <laughs> that was it, that was it, no. Um, but, you know, I really understood that right. um, annoyance because, you know, you're just, you're just trying to get by, you're just trying to have an equal footing, but you still feel like you're being effed over. Yeah. in some way and you can't quite work out what it is until you've had a bit of time to reflect mm. and for John that's her whole working career yeah. until this one moment yeah. when she goes oh hang on a minute sex can be so much more for me than yeah. just a you know way to make money <laughs> I love that I think it's interesting I th and I think that's a uniquely female or just in the position of oppressed in some way kind of feeling that it's hard to yeah that it's almost a requirement not to feel like that. And that's what's so interesting about Chantal Ackerman we were talking about, and as you brought up actually, she started to move out of just talking about feminist issues. Mm. I don't think that was ever her one thing, but she started to more explicitly talk about um, the Holocaust and her Jewish um, past, and she also started to make work about migrants, and so she's always looking for the other in society. Mm. And um, as we were talking about with the Laura Mulvey article as well, responses by people like Stuart Hall um, who talked about otherness and started to bridge lots of different groups of other, you know, the woman, the gay, the non-binary, the disabled, whatever, um, or the non-abled, you know, um, started to, I think, you know, Ackerman did start to pull that together in her art practice, and that's when she moved more into a kind of fine arts mm -hmm. um, realm. And I mean, do you think partly because that, was being explored in the fine arts and there wasn't time for it in cinema just yet? Or do you think maybe it was her technique and her way of making that just suited better after this, a fine art realm? I mean, hard to know, but I wonder if um, there are some concepts that are just better portrayed through different mediums, perhaps, or that she felt, going back to the fact that it was her masterpiece at 25 that she couldn't possibly outdo Jean Dielman if she was suppose she's changing subject matter in a way but just trying to like reinvent or trying to just push herself in a new direction I don't know but it's I think it's an interesting career move certainly and a very um selfless one totally and she said when she was researching and kind of getting inspired for Jean Dielman she was watching um, Michael Snow's Wavelength which is, I think, 40, is it 42 or 47 minutes okay. of really slow camera movement. And after the war, we saw quite a lot of this kind of slow camera, quite removed um, cinematography, which also, Ackham says, inspired her, um, because there was this sense of estrangement and trauma. Um, but, you know, it hadn't been done with a woman. And so for Ackerman, John Dillman was the 
the time for the woman to have her moment as the um, the voice that wasn't heard within the crowd. She wasn't just another member of the public. She was a very particularly oppressed member of the public who wasn't overtly oppressed in the eyes of men. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Very, It's been great. Um, really interesting to delve into some feminist cinema. So thank you for putting it together. Thank you for the opportunity. It's been great. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> it's pleasure's all ours. <laughs> Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, all the podcasts will be on various platforms: YouTube, Spotify. Yeah, it should yeah. be. Those, you know, you'll you'll <laughs> you'll find it somewhere. Um, yeah. So Catherine's articles are on our website. So do read them if you haven't already. Um, good. Okay. All right. Yes. Thank you.